Hello, we had ended the last lecture by writing a simple C program to compute the factorial of a given non-negative integer. Today what we will do is to start again with that program, dissect it and try to understand how it works. The idea is to understand basic constructs of the C language before discussing them in a more formal setting. So let's uh, look at this program again. This is the program that we had written last time with a few modifications. So let's start examining it line by line and see what is happening in this program. So what we have here is what is known as a comment. A comment is a uh, piece of information which the machine will completely ignore and this is intended only as information for people who are going to read this program. Although not very important in this particular program because this is a particularly simple program, but as we write more and more complex programs, uh, it will become increasingly more important to write comments so that we ourselves and those others who read our programs can understand what our program is doing and how it is doing that. So you see anything enclosed between a slash star and a star slash is a comment. So this entire thing is a comment from here to here and uh, this comment basically just gives some simple information about what this program does. Let's come to the next line. This is hash include stdio.h. will not explain the syntax in detail uh, here in this lecture. Uh, but let me just explain what is the purpose of such a statement or line in this program. Actually there are a lot of uh, useful library functions that are available to a C programmer. Uh, to give some examples, uh, we have uh, functions to find uh, trigonometric uh, values, for example the sine, cosine, tangent, etc. of a given angle and so on and so forth. Apart from that we have a number of useful functions which we'll start seeing slowly one by one. There are two uh, libraries particularly of interest to us in this course that is the standard C library and the math library. The functions that I mentioned just now just like sine, cosine etc. they belong to the math library. In this program we are going to use uh, two functions for input and output namely scanf which you can see here. This is for reading some input from the user and printf which you see here. This is used for writing some output to the terminal and uh, these are not defined by the C language itself but are functions made available to us by the standard C library and this line here include stdio.h basically tells the compiler that in our program we are going to use some functions, IO related functions from the standard C library. Okay, so let's now go to the next line which is main void and an opening curly brace. Uh, it's not important to understand exactly the significance of main void at this point in time. Uh, we'll just say that at this point in time we'll just say that this line signifies to the compiler that here comes my program. This is where the program begins and the entire program is between this opening brace or the parenthesis and this closing curly parenthesis or the, or the closing brace. So this entire thing is the body of our program as it is called. Within the body of the program this first line declares two variables n and result. So this is known as a uh, variable declaration. This line says that I am going to use two variables in my program whose names are respectively n and result and both these variables are going to hold integer values. So integer is a type which is uh, denoted in C by int. There are a number of other useful types in C uh, as well which we will see later on. Right now the integer type is enough for us. So essentially this time is saying that we are going to use two variables in our program. Their names are n and result and both are going to hold integer values. In C as in most languages before you use any variable you must declare that variable and in the program uh, most of the times the variable declarations will be first followed by the actual uh, actions that you want the program to perform. Okay, the next line is a call to a library function called scanf as I explained earlier. The scanf is a standard 
C library function which is used to read some data from the user. It has two what are known as arguments. This percent D encapsulated within double quote characters is the first argument and this M percent N is the second argument. Uh, and this, this, this percent D within the double quote characters is what is known as a string. We will talk about strings in more detail later on in the course. But essentially this particular piece of information which we are supplying to Stanis is saying that in the input we are expecting the user to give an integer value. And the second argument M percent N says where we want this value given by the user to be stored in. So essentially this this entire line is saying that we are expecting an integer to be input by the user and whatever integer he gives as input should be stored in the variable called n. This line we have already seen earlier, this is just an assignment statement if you recall. The equal to sign in C is an assignment statement. Recall that this line is not stating that the result is equal to 1, on the other hand it is an action is saying make the value of result to be equal to 1. So it is an initialization. We are setting the result to 1. You remember the algorithm for the factorial uh, computing factorials from the previous lecture. And remember that we had to repeatedly multiply the result by n as long as n was more than 1 and uh, in each step also decrement the value of n by 1. So this here is a while loop. And this while loop says that some piece of code has to be repeatedly executed and along with the while we have to say two things how long that computation has to be repeated. So this is the condition n greater than 1 which says how long the computation has to be repeated. It has to be repeated as long as the value of n is greater than 1. As, as soon as the value of n becomes less than 1 that is less than or equal to 0 then the computation has to be stopped. And what has to be done in each step or each iteration of the while loop that is again enclosed within this curly brace here and the corresponding closing curly brace here. So along with while we have to give a condition like this and we have to give a single C statement. An assignment is a single C statement as we have already seen but here as you know we want to do two things repeatedly in every iteration of the loop namely assigning result to result into n and decrementing the value of n. So these are two statements. By putting them within a curly brace, we make these two simple statements into what is known as a compound statement. So the result is that this entire thing is now a single C statement because it has been encapsulated in this opening brace and this closing brace. And the compound statement itself as you can see is a number of simple statements enclosed in the brace pair. And finally when this loop is done, as we know the value of result contains the factorial of n, so we need to print that. So we are printing the value of result here in this statement using the C library function again called printf. And again in printf we have to specify essentially what we want to print. We want to print an integer, so that is what this person D denotes and this backslash n denotes that after this integer has been printed the cursor should move on to the next line. The backslash n stands for the new line character in C. And of course what integer should be printed is this value that is the value of the variable called result. Note that in CNF when we specify where the value that has been read from the user is to be placed the variable has to be preceded by an ampersand. Whereas when printing, we don't have to give this m percent. Right now, just remember this as a rule. We'll explain later why this is so. So hopefully this program is correct and uh, you have understood this. Let's now go ahead and make some minor modifications to this program to enhance it. The first simple enhancement that we'll make to this program is that when we run this program, we want the user to be told that the program is expecting an integer as an input. As of now, the user does not get this information. Let us compile the current program and see how it runs.
you see the program just appears to stop and the user is supposed to type some number here so let's say we type 10 and the answer is printed but the user doesn't really know what is going on here when the integer is expected so if we could give some message saying that uh, we want him to input a number then that will be useful so how do we do that well we already know how to print some message using the printf function so all we need to do is to add a printf statement before the scanf statement right so that before the program stops and waits for the input it prints a message on the screen saying that some integer input is expected so let's add a printf statement Note that we have not added a backslash n at the end of this uh, string because after this message is printed, we do not want the cursor to go to the next line. We'll see in a minute what is going to happen when we run this program. Let's make another simple change. When we show the output, let's also say that this number that we are printing is actually the factorial of the number that was input. So we want something. Uh, what, what we want to appear is something like. 5 factorial is equal to 120. So to do that, we need to print another integer and therefore another person d. And after this integer, we want the factorial sign to come and then equal and then this, the result of the, the factorial of the given number. And now this printf string contains two person d's and therefore as the following arguments to the printf function call, we should supply two integers. The first integer is n and the second integer is result. So what's going to happen is that when this line is executed, this string will be printed on the screen as it is, except that the first person d will be replaced by the value of n and the second person d will be replaced by the value of result. So let's save this program, compile it again and see how it works this time. You see that it is asking us to enter an integer n and because we did not end the string with a backslash n, the cursor is on the same line and has not gone to the next line. So let's enter again 10, oops, there is an error. So let's go back and correct this error. Why has this error occurred? This error has actually occurred because the value of n has decremented in this loop 10 times and 9 times and has finally become 1. Remember that in every iteration of the loop we are decrementing n by 1. So at the end of the loop the value of n has actually become become just 1 regardless of what the original value is. If we want to print the initial value of n here, we will have to save the old value of n. So we can save that into another variable. Let's call that initial n and the initial value of this will be just 10. Note that we are using a new variable now and so therefore we need to declare this variable as well. The type is again integer. So here is the declaration of initial n and this n must be replaced by initial n. I think we are all done with these changes to the program. Let's try it out again. Compile it again and run it again. 10 and we see 10 factorial is equal to the value of 10 factorial. Okay, let's now make some more changes to this program. Uh, what happens if I, when running this program, if I give a negative value for 10? Let's try that for, for n, I'm sorry. Let's give minus 2. The result comes out to be 1, which obviously is wrong. In fact, the factorial of negative numbers is not defined at all. So, how did we get this result 1? Well, if you examine this program, suppose the value of n is minus 1, what is going to happen? The result is initialized to 1, initial n is, is initialized to minus 2, and then we execute this loop while n greater than 1. And what is the value of n? The value of n is minus 2, which is not greater than 1, so the loop terminates right away. And these two statements do not get executed even once. And as a result, the value of the variable result doesn't change at all. It remains whatever it was before the execution of the loop, which is 1. And therefore, we are getting this erroneous result, minus 2 factorial equal to 1. What we should have this program do instead is that if a negative value for n is given, 
it should print a message saying that the factorial function is defined only for non negative integers well how do we do that well after it, it's quite easy after reading the value of n we have to check whether or not it is more than 0 if it is more than 0 or greater, if it is greater than or equal to 0 we do all this computation otherwise we simply print a message saying that factorial is defined only for non negative integers and to do that we will need to use another statement of c which is an if else con construct which essentially does something if a condition is true and something else possibly if the condition is false so what should be the condition here the condition should be if n is greater than equal to 0 so if n is greater than equal to 0 then we want to perform all the computation from here to here right so therefore this will be the then part of the if statement that is that is the part that will execute if this condition is indeed true that is if n is greater than equal to 0 note how the greater than equal to condition is written in C with a greater than sign followed by an equal to sign and just like the while loop here along with the condition we are supposed to give a single C statement which says what should be done if the with the single C statement which should be executed if the condition actually evaluates to true and since we have number of C statements here we need to include these statements again within braces to make a compound statement out of these and if the value of n is indeed less than 0 that is it is not greater than equal to 0 then we want to execute something else which is just printing a message saying that factorial is defined only for non negative integers. Note that in the else part there is only a single C statement that we want to execute namely this printf function and therefore we don't need to put this within braces even though if we did put them in braces it would be fine. Okay, so this program will work but I am not quite satisfied with this because even though this is syntactically correct and it will actually work but this is hard to read. Uh, note that so far we have been following a style of writing a program which we have not explicitly discussed but let me now illustrate what I am trying to say so these two statements constitute the body of this while loop and because these two statements are indented to the left to the right I am sorry by a certain amount that is these start here whereas the while started at this location so it was quite clear that these two statements are within the while loop. This is called indentation and this is very necessary to make our program readable. Similarly note that here since this printf is within the else we have started it at a horizontal location after the part after the place where the else starts. So what is wrong with this program? Well if you see this entire sequence of statements is within the if statement which is a kind of super statement for all these statements and therefore they should start further towards the right then the program will be much more readable. So we need to insert some blank spaces here so that uh, they start more to the right. In, in C actually we can liberally you know uh, intersperse our statements with number of spaces and uh, blank lines as we wish. Uh, but a certain programming style as I, as I said is desirable so that the program is readable. Instead of uh, inserting number of spaces it is usually convenient to just insert a tab character. This is on the left top area of your keyboard. So let's just press the tab character here and as you see uh, a tab character is roughly equivalent to number of spaces. So this statement has now gone to the left. Let's do the same thing with this statement with this statement what about these two these are actually within while so they should be further indented to the right so one more tab here one more tab here this brace is the ending of the while so it should be at the same level as at the while 
here and this printf again is at the same level as the while it is directly within the if so it should come here and now you can see the program is much more readable it is clear that these two statements for example are within if the while is within the if but these two statements are within the while which is within the if okay so let's now save this program again and try to compile it and hope that there are no errors let's try with a normal number non negative integer first is 120 works fine let's try with a negative integer and we get what is expected namely a message saying that the factorial function is defined only for non negative integers so there are two things that we have learned by doing this simple enhancement to the program the first which is very important is that the program must check that all inputs given to the program by the user are within an acceptable range because if the inputs are not within the expected range the program is likely to behave in an unpredictable fashion and the output is only likely to confuse the user so therefore we had to check that the value of n is indeed greater than equal to 0 the second thing we have learned is the importance of indentation and we have seen how it makes the program much more readable and uh, in all programs that we write from now on therefore we will consistently use the indentation style that i have introduced in this lecture okay we will now take another example problem and try to first develop an algorithm for it and then write a c program for solving that problem the problem is a very famous one and it has to do with what are known as fibonacci number the fibonacci sequence of numbers is defined as follows these are the numbers in the sequence and as you can observe in this sequence any number is the sum of the previous two numbers in the sequence so we can define this in mathematical terms as follows so let's say f of i denotes the ith fibonacci number so f of 0 is 0 f1 is 1 and for i greater than 1 f of i is nothing but f of i minus 1 plus f of i minus 2 so let us say given this definition we are given an integer n greater than equal to 0 and we want to compute the value of fn that is the nth number counting from 0 in the sequence that we just saw so how do we go about solving this problem so as you can see for solving this problem what we need to do is to remember the previous two numbers in the sequence and then if we add up these two numbers we get the next number in the sequence so let us say at any point in time we want to maintain the value of a as the value of fi and b let's say as the value of fi minus 1 So suppose at any point in time in our program for some value of i less than or equal to n the value of a is the same as the value of fi and the value of b is the same as the value of fi minus 1 and then then what do we do in the next step what we'll do is to use these two values to compute the value of fi plus 1 which will simply be a plus b right so let's write c as a plus b and in the next step we still want this invariant to hold that is a is f of i and b is f of i minus 1 so what we we'll need to do is increment i to i plus 1 and the value of a will be c and the value of b will be the old value of a uh, but there is a problem Uh, where is the old value of a we have already overwritten it with c right so we can do these two in the reverse order let's just erase this a little bit and write so in every step of the program 
this is the computation that we are going to perform as you can imagine this will be done repeatedly as long as i is less than n so this will be repeated as long as i is less than n because as soon as i becomes equal to n then this invariant tells us that the value of fn is nothing but a so we stop doing this computation at that point in time so note that if at this point in time it was the case that a is equal to fi and b is equal to fi minus 1 then at this point in time it will also be the case that a is equal to fi and b is equal to fi minus 1 why because we have incremented i by 1 but the numbers a and b now are the old values of a plus b and the old value of a respectively that is if the value of i was i0 to begin with a was a0 to begin with and b was b0 to begin with then after the end of this computation the value of i will be i0 plus 1 the value of a will be a0 plus b0 because a is assigned c here which is a plus b and the value of b will be b0 no the value of b will be a0 and you can observe that a0 plus b0 is simply f of i0 plus 1 and a0 of course is f of i0 why is a0 plus b0 f of i0 plus 1 because a0 is f of i and b0 is f of i minus 1 and by the definition of the fibonacci series f of i plus f of i minus 1 is f of i plus 1 so at the end of the this particular computation we will again end up with these values which satisfy the invariance that at any point in time a is equal to f i and b is equal to f of i minus 1 based on these ideas we can now easily develop a c program for computing the nth number in the fibonacci series using the tools that we have already seen Uh, by writing the factorial program so let's go and do it now okay so let's now write a c program based on the algorithm that we just discussed to compute the nth fibonacci number so let's start a editor window name of the program is going to be fib.c so let's start with a comment explaining what this program is going to do So this is a program to compute the nth Fibonacci number, and remember that this is the end of the comment, the star, and followed by the slash. And again, we are going to use the scanf and printf functions from the standard C library. So we include stdio.h as the core, and here comes our program. We indent all statements remember by one tab space because they are all part of the main program and the first thing if you remember is that we have to declare the variables that we are going to use so we are going to use variables n n will hold the number that the user has given to us a and b will use as in the algorithm that is a will hold the ith fibonacci number f of i b will hold f of i minus 1 and i itself of course is Uh, the current index of the Fibonacci number that we have computed, and C, remember, we used for computing the sum of A and B. So these are the variables that we are going to use. So what do we do next? Well, let's again prompt the user that a non-negative integer is expected. Using the printf statement. and then we read the value of n as before right and again we need to check whether n is less than 0 or greater than equal to 0 because if n is less than 0 then that's not a valid input and we must terminate the program after telling the user that he must enter a non negative integer so let's check whether n is less than 0 if n is less than 0 then all we want to do is to print a message saying that the number you have entered that is n is not a non negative integer so let's just write not non negative and 
since we have used the person D here, we must specify what actual value should be replaced, should replace this person D, and that of course is L. Right? So, for example, if the user enters minus 2, this printf statement will result in output saying minus 2 is not non negative. Okay? And since this is a single statement that we want to execute if the value of n is less than 0, we don't need braces here. Otherwise, that is, if n is greater than or equal to 0, we want to do our computation of fn. So, <coughs> that will require multiple statements and so therefore we need to enclose them uh, in braces and make them a compound statement. For our own reference, let's write the definition of the function f here as a comment, remember. Okay, so we are ready to start. So we need to initialize the integers a, b and i, the value n has already been read. The c we don't need to initialize, the variable c we don't need to initialize because that will be initialized based on the value of a and b in every iteration of the loop. But a, b and i have to be initialized and remember the constraint we have that we must ensure that at any point in time before starting any iteration of the while loop, the value of a must be equal to f of i and the value of b must be f of i minus 1. So, let's initialize i to 1, a to 1 which is f of 1 and b to 0 because that is f of i minus 1 since i is 1, so i minus 1 is 0 and f of 0 is 0. So, therefore, b has to be initialized to 0. Note that all these statements are within the else and therefore they are indented to the right by some space after the else. And next comes our loop, while i is less than n, we need to do certain computations. Why? We have to do them only as long as i is less than n, because remember that if i becomes equal to n, then we have already found the answer, and the answer is a. Okay, so while i is less than n, remember what we need to do? Compute a plus b in let's say C, then assign B to A and A to C and of course increment I by I plus, increment I by 1 that is make it I plus 1 and that's the end of the body of the while loop and now what do we do? This is again still within the else part, this is the computation we are doing if n is less than, if n is greater than or equal to 0. Now we have found fn, so we want to print the value of fn. So let's just print again using the print statement, f of n is equal to the fn that we have computed. And what should go here? The first person d should be replaced by the value of n which in this program we have not modified anywhere as you can see after reading it from the user. We don't need to save it in some other variable, we can just use n and this should be replaced by the answer which is f of n and f of n remember now is equal to a because i has become equal to n, right? So that's all we need to do and then this is the end of the else block and this is the end of the main program. So let's save this and compile this and run. So, this warning is only because I didn't add a new line at the end of the program, not that it matters too much. So, let's compile it again, find the side. So, let's enter let's say 2 f of 2 is 1, is that correct? Yes, it is because f of 2 is f of 1 plus f of 0, which means 1 plus 0, which is 1. So, let's try it for some more values. 3 should be 2. 4 should give us the sum of the last two values, which is 2 plus 1, 3, that's correct. 5 should give us 3 plus 2, which is 5. It seems to be working all right. Let's also try with the border cases. The border cases are the ones in which 
you know, the loop will run at most once or not at all and so on. So let's first try with minus 1, a negative integer. We get the correct message, minus 1 is not non-negative. Let's now try with 1, give the right answer. Let's try with 0, huh? that's wrong, because f of 0 by definition, by our own definition is 0 and not 1. So what went wrong in the program? So suppose n was equal to 0, then what happened? It came here, we initialized i to 1, a to 1, b to 0, while i less than n, i is, has been initialized to 1 and the value of n is 0. So i is not less than n and in fact it is not even equal to n. See here in the print statement, we assume that at the end of the loop, i will be equal to n and therefore f of i will be equal to f of n which will in turn be equal to a. But here is a special case in which the value of i has not become equal to n at the end of the loop. In fact, i here is uh, i here is 1 while n is 0. So in this case, we should print not the value of a as the answer but the value of b which of course is 0. So therefore, this print statement has to be changed. So we want to, the result is a only if n is equal to i. Otherwise, the answer is b. So therefore, we need another if else. So let's add that. If n is equal to i, we have, this is the first time we are using the equality operator in C. Note that this is different from the assignment which is a single equal to and this is equality or comparison between n and i whether n is actually equal to i or not. So if n is equal to i, then the, ans then the answer that we were previously printing is indeed correct. That is, f of n is equal to f of y is equal to a. But if it is not the case, and this case remember will happen only when n is 0. So if n is 0, the answer of course is 0. So we can just print this or of course we could have taken the longer form and said print f, f of percent d equal to percent d backslash n comma n comma b not a or comma n comma 0. But because we know that in this case n is going to be 0 and f of 1 is also going to be 0, we can just simplify it like this. Okay, and that should solve our problem. So let's compile this program again and let's try it this time with 0. It works. With 1, still works. 2, 3, 4, 5, and it works for all possible integer values. So the program is finally correct. Okay, so in this lecture we have had a gentle introduction to the basic elements of the C programming language. In the next lecture onwards we will start looking at the elements of C in a little bit more detail and somewhat more formally. But before we end today's lecture, I would like you to leave with an assignment that you should try out on your own, uh, very similar to the problem that we have already solved in this lecture, based again on the Fibonacci number. So the problem that we solved was that given an n, we tried to compute the value of f of n. But suppose uh, we are given a k and we want to write a program which says whether or not k is a Fibonacci number. That is, whether there exists an i such that f of i is equal to k. And if such an i does exist, then the value of i should be printed. Otherwise, the program should say that k is not a Fibonacci number. And to solve this problem, there is a little hint that you might want to use. And the hint is that the Fibonacci number sequence is monotonically increasing. That is, every number except in the beginning is more than the previous number in the sequence. So, the essential idea of solving this problem is to generate Fibonacci numbers one by one till we get a number which is either equal to k or more than k. If we get a number which is equal to k, then we know that it's a Fibonacci number and by keeping track of i, we should be able to say which Fibonacci number it is, that is what is the corresponding i such that f of i is equal to k. On the other hand, if we directly go from a number less than k to a number greater than k, then clearly k is not a Fibonacci number and then the program should say that the given value is not a Fibonacci number.